Hello, yes. Uh, hello, friends. Good evening to all. Myself, Akshay Kumar, YA Chair, Ashraj, Chandigarh Chapter. So, welcome to this webinar jointly organized by Ashray Chandigarh Chapter and Ashray Falcon Chapter. And this is also supported by the youth at Ishray. I am sure you all are aware of Ashray. Uh, uh, Ashray is the American Society of heating, refrigerating, and air conditioning engineers. Uh, this society has mission to serve humanity by advancing art and science of HVAC and R and their allied fields. This society consists of all the professional members related to HVAC and building industry. With the initiation taken by Ashray Chandigarh chapter to spread knowledge among the members, during the lockdown period. So today is our 70th webinar on fundamentals of UV GI for air and surface disinfection. To go through with the activities done by Ashray Chandigarh chapter or any other reason chapter. If you are Ashray member, then it's very good. If you are not, then be a part of Ashray by register yourself online at joint.ashray.org. Now, moving to the uh, ASHRAE Code of Ethics, in this and all other ASHRAE meetings, we will act with honesty, fairness, courtesy, competence, inclusiveness, and respect for others, which exemplify our uh, core value of excellence, commitment, integrity, collaboration, volunteerism, and diversity, and shall avoid all real or perceived conflict of interest. Now, I would like to introduce today presenter, the chair of Ashray Epidemic Task Force, uh, Mr. William P. Panfleth. He is PhD, PE, uh, fellow Ashray, fellow ASME, FISI, ASQ. Uh, he is a professor of architectural engineering, the Pennsylvania State University, USA. Uh, Presidential member, he's a presidential member of ASHRAE. He's a ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer. He's a chair of ASHRAE Ep Epidemic Task Force. So now recording of the uh, webinar will be uploaded on YouTube channel. Please subscribe our YouTube digital channel, ASHRAE Chandigarh. Uh, question and answer will be done at the end of session. You can ask your question by typing in chat box and same will be answered at the end by speaker. Now I request Mr. William P. Barnflet, please present your presentation. Now over to you, uh, William, sir. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm waiting. How do I share my screen? There we go. Are you seeing my slides or are you seeing my email? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please share your presentation. Uh, what are you seeing at this point? Is it, it are you, I clicked uh, share. No, sir, we are not seeing your presentation. Please share your presentation, please. Uh, I've clicked show screen. Which which screen are you seeing? Sir, uh, we are seeing Ashray. Uh, we are seeing your email now. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm. Now I'm, PPT is. Uh, I know what I need to do. Hang on. I need to Sir, do this. We again, your email is. Is that better? I switch screen. Yes. Yes, now no, now this is visible, sir. Okay, then, then we're good to go. Thank you very much for uh, inviting you, me to, to speak today. This is my uh, first visit, in quotes, to the, the Chandigarh chapter. I, I hope to be there in person someday. And uh, greetings also to the uh, UAE Falcon chapter. I have been there a couple of times during my, <clears throat> my travels. And I, I see there are uh, almost 500 people on, on the... Uh, webinar this morning. I'm, I'm very glad to be with all of you. 
this evening where you are perhaps and the morning where I am. Um, the, the talk today is very relevant to the current situation. I've, I've been studying uh, ultraviolet disinfection for more than 20 years, but there's never been more interest in it than there is uh, today. And that's very appropriate because uh, as you'll see, it's a technology that can be very effective for controlling uh, infectious diseases. So I'll, I'll be giving you a, um, uh, an overview of, of many aspects of that technology today and hopefully if you're interested in applying it, this will uh, get you started. I'll give some references at the end that you can read further. So this is a, uh, an ASHRAE Distinguished Lecture presentation. So it's been uh, registered for various professional development credits. We'll go past that right to the outline. So uh, these are the, the topics that we'll cover this morning. Uh, introduction through fundamentals, through applications of UV system types, some discussion of its effectiveness as shown in the literature, a little bit of economic analysis, and uh, a case study of uh, a modeling uh, analysis, and then conclude. <clears throat> Hopefully that will not take an hour. Um, so to the introduction, uh, a few words about different microorganisms and, and control alternatives to UV and a, a bit about the history. So what we're talking about uh, here is controlling any type of microorganism, bacteria, virus, um, or even fungi in some cases, but we're uh, very concerned about Fung uh, bacteria that cause uh, serious diseases like tuberculosis and, and uh, anthrax and uh, MRSA, uh, multiple drug resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, viruses that cause various illnesses from the cold to SARS, to influenza, and, and today COVID-19. These come from infected humans, and in some cases, they may be uh, the biological terror uh, agents. Back in the, the early 21st century, we had a number of incidents where anthrax was uh, sent around to buildings as a, uh, a biological terror agent. So the characteristics of these microorganisms is that they're uh, they're very small, from from microns to nanometers in size, but they typically ride on uh, particles, droplet residues that are produced when someone coughs or sneezes. Uh, and uh, also possibly on dust particles that they get attached to. Uh, the, the transmission modes that are, are common for these diseases that we can do something about are airborne transmission and fomite transmission. Uh, airborne transmission means transmission through the air that is uh, inhaled, could be at relatively short distance, could be at longer distance. Uh, fomite transfer is transfer involving a, an intermediate surface. So infectious material goes from an infected host to a surface such as a, a countertop or a, a doorknob or even uh, someone's hand and then is transferred to someone who's susceptible. So with this technology, we can uh, address both of those. Fungi are the, uh, the other type of uh, microorganism that we may be able to do something about. These generally don't cause infectious diseases, but they're implicated in many other uh, problems such as allergies and uh, asthma attacks. They can be opportunist, opportunistic infections that uh, afflict people who are immune suppressed. If they've had an operation and have been given immunosuppressants, say for a transplant operation, or if they have uh, a disease uh, like AIDS uh, that will suppress the immune system. So these grow in, in the presence of food and water. They're not uh, coming from an infected host typically, and those include things like Aspergillus, Stachybotrys, and Penicillium that we find in buildings that have moisture problems. So these grow on surfaces. They uh, create mats or mycelia, and uh, spores of, of my, uh, fungi are generally much larger than bacteria or viruses. They can be in the one to 10 micron range. Uh, they produce some VOCs that can be irritants and they also produce substances called mycotoxins that are also air contaminants if they become uh, vaporized. 
in, in HVAC systems, we find these uh, growing on cooling coils and, and also on damp filter media and other surfaces. So how can we control these various microorganisms? Uh, for pathogens, one of the best methods, as we have been hearing about uh, regularly in, in guidance on suppressing the COVID-19 pandemic, is to limit person-to-person -person transmission with good hygiene. So this means hand washing, it may mean uh, distancing as we've been doing, or even uh, sheltering in place, lockdowns that uh, were mentioned in the introduction today. For fungi, the best thing to do to control fungi is to control the source by keeping buildings properly dehumidified and, and preventing moisture intrusion by the way the envelope of the building is designed. So those are, are really effective ways to uh, control many of, of these microorganisms. For all of them, if we can't do those things, we have a certain number of engineering controls that we can apply to inactivate or kill them in, in occupied spaces or in our systems. So we can use particulate filtration to remove particles that contain microorganisms from the air. We can dilute air with uh, ventilation. We can, on surfaces, do chemical uh, surface cleaning and uh, in the air and on surfaces, we can inactivate using <clears throat> various technologies. So filters are uh, quite effective if we uh, get filters that will handle the right particle size. All of these biological agents that can be airborne are filterable to some extent, even individual viruses, although they generally don't exist <clears throat> in nature because they're shed in respiratory droplets that have proteins and salts and other things in them that will not completely evaporate. So a respiratory droplet uh, will evaporate to a particle that's substantially smaller, but not as small as a virus. So the effectiveness of the removal with a filter depends on the particle size and the efficiency of the, the filter. <clears throat> There's a uh, chart over on the right-hand side of this figure that shows typical uh, grade efficiency curves, efficiency of removal versus particle size for filters that are rated according to the ASHRAE standard 52.2 MERV rating system, minimum efficiency reporting value. And that rates efficiency in three different size ranges down to 0.3 micrometers. And the larger the number, the better the filter. So you see at the bottom there, MERV 6 and MERV 8. Those are the filter sizes that are currently the minimum requirements in ASHRAE's ventilation standards. MERV 6 for residential buildings in 62.2 and MERV 8 and, uh, for non-residential, non-healthcare facilities in 62.1. Now those filters are, are not very effective for small particles that may contain microorganisms. What we really need is a filter that is going to be effective across the, uh, say, five micrometer and smaller range. And uh, that takes at least a MERV-13 filter. If you see, look at MERV-13, the most penetrating particle size around 0.2 micrometers for this representative curve is about 40%. Uh, even better than that, though, and, and still uh, relatively in the same price range and performance characteristics is MERV-14, which could be 60% and higher in that range. So these are filters that now ASHRAE and its COVID-19 guidance is recommending that uh, building owners and operators upgrade to if they have filters that are uh, more of the efficiency range that are associated with our minimum ventilation standards. Uh, the really high efficiency filters, HEPA, uh, for example, that's 99.97% efficient for particles of 0.3 micrometers in the, the test procedure that's used to rate them, uh, are expensive and have high pressure drops, and they're not a very feasible retrofit in many systems, although we can use portable air cleaners that have HEPA filters in them. Uh, filters remove particles, but uh, the media, if it becomes wet, can actually become a, a place where fungi and bacteria will grow. And you can see a contaminated filter uh, over there on the left-hand side in this figure. 
viruses don't generally multiply outside of a host. So uh, when viral particles get into the air, they may be collected by a filter. And as long as they remain active, they may contaminate it. But we don't have a, a high level of concern that if uh, a particle has been on a filter for several days, that it poses a, a large uh, risk of infecting someone. But at the same time, we recommend that filters be handled carefully if they're being changed during the pandemic, that those who work with them should wear personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, and uh, bag the filter and uh, clean up carefully after they're done working on it. So filtration works, but um, to do it properly may require more cost than we're used to uh, investing in filters in buildings. Ventilation, of course, will dilute all contaminants that are airborne, but depending on the climate in which a building is located, this can be a very expensive energy proposition. Uh, hot, humid climates in particular, where many of the people on this call are probably living. So it, uh, it also has its uh, good points and its less good points. Uh, UVGI is an example of a technology that inactivates. We won't talk about the others here, but um, there are, are several that don't actually remove particles from the air or remove them from the building by displacement. Uh, it uses mainly ultraviolet C and ultraviolet B radiation from the 200 to 320 nanometer spectral range as shown on the image here. And that damages the uh, DNA and the RNA of, of uh, viruses, bacteria, and fungi. There are uh, base pairs in DNA, for example, adenine and thymine base pairs that uh, connect together. And uh, photons of light in this range will break the bond, and the uh, thymine base pair bases will form. Uh, dimers and, and that damage is what contributes to the uh, inactivation of the microorganism, so it can't repeat itself. We'll look at that in a little more detail in a bit. Uh, susceptibility of microorganisms to UV uh, C and UVB varies greatly. The, the main wavelength we use, for reasons I'll explain, is is about 254 nanometer UVC. Uh, I have an example here on the screen with anthrax and uh, with the uh, bacterium that causes uh, pneumonia. And we see there that when we irradiate them with the same strength of, of 254 nanometer UVC, that the, the strep is reduced almost to nothing over a, a period of uh, two seconds with 500 microwatts per square centimeter while anthrax hardly uh, responds at all. So it's important to know what you're trying to uh, disinfect and to design the system properly for it. Uh, for some resistant microorganisms like anthrax, filtration may be a better option. Uh, anthrax is a fairly large spore and fairly easily filtered with sub-HEPA filtration. And we can also com uh, combine UV and, and filtration to get a, an overall high system uh, in activation and removal efficiency as well. <clears throat> so now fundamentals about how microbes response and uh, respond and uh, UV sources and uh, a little history as well. Uh, I wanna emphasize to everyone that this is not a technology that uh, just <clears throat> emerged in the last few years. The, the study of disinfection with light actually goes back to some fundamental studies in the 19th century. And there were applications of UV for water treatment prior to 1910. There was an actual working water treatment plant that uh, began operation around 1906. And by the 1930s, uh, it was being applied in, um, in research projects in schools in the Philadelphia area in the US to see whether it could control a measles epidemic and it actually was very effective as we'll discuss later. So you see here on the screen a number of other milestones in the development of uh, the technology and its adoption. It's now uh, been accepted for
for tuberculosis control by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for more than 25 years. So it's, it's a very well-established technology. So here in a little more detail is this uh, issue of, of germicidal action and how that works. So on the, uh, the left-hand side here, we have an image of a uh, healthy and normal uh, double helix DNA molecule with its base pairs, uh, adenine and thymine always go together and cytosine and guanine all, always go together. And a photon comes in that uh, breaks bonds in some uh, adenine thymine pairs, the yellow to, to green. <clears throat> and you can see on the after irradiation image on the right-hand side of that figure, the two yellow uh, thymine bases that have bonded with one another. So uh, that damage makes the uh, replication process uh, work less well. And if there's enough damage, then uh, you will, will not have replication of the uh, DNA containing microorganism. It's the same process for RNA, only uh, different base pairs <clears throat> may be involved. So the, the germicidal activity of, of light uh, has been studied extensively. And uh, while there are some differences across microorganisms, they're pretty similar. So we can use standard inactivation curves or uh, act activation spectra, as they're sometimes called, as shown in the figure on the right. And you can see that the, the maximum uh, effectiveness is around 265 nanometers and that it decreases rather rapidly uh, in either direction from that point. <clears throat> Actually, if we continued this uh, curve off to uh, lower wavelengths, you would see that it would turn up again. Actually, down in the far UV region, down there around 220, uh, we have pretty good uh, effectiveness again. Uh, and there are some reasons that we might want to use that wavelength range, but it hasn't really been fully developed into uh, widely used products yet. We might be able to talk about that a little bit later on. So mostly we focus on UVC that's as close to that maximum effectiveness point as we can get it. <clears throat> the, uh, the disinfection curve for uh, ultraviolet is like other disinfection curves, it's exponential. So uh, if S is the, the fraction of an initial population of microorganisms, the, the number surviving divided by the number that we started out with, uh, that survival fraction will be to a first approximation equal to the exponential of uh, minus KIT, where K is a, a deactivation rate constant. This is a property of microorganisms that has to be measured. And the units of that um, can vary, but one way of representing it that's pretty common is in units of centimeter squared per microwatt second, or that would be centimeter squared per microjoule, since a watt second is a joule. And the uh, fluence of UV energy, uh, which really means the amount of energy that's uh, received from all directions, imagine a sphere around a, a target, a particle that may contain some viruses, uh, it's that integration over the whole sphere that is the fluence, as opposed to a radiance on a, a plane, which is what we normally measure with instruments. So that, that's measured in microwatts per centimeter squared. So the product of K and I has uh, uh, units of inverse time. And T is the time of exposure. So K I is the time constant of this exponential and IT is the dose that's delivered. So for any microorganism, there is a dose, I times T, that will achieve a certain survival. And so this is the basic equation for design. If we want to get 90% uh, inactivation on a single pass through a device that uses UV, um, we, and we know the rate constant for the microorganism, then we can calculate from this equation what I times T must be, what the dose must be. And if we know what exposure time is available, then we can calculate what the fluence needs to be. And that allows us then to design a, a piece of equipment that will uh, achieve that objective. 
So there are uh, very large differences in K across different microorganisms. And uh, just a few representative values here. Uh, anthrax has very small value, which means it's uh, very resistant. Uh, influenza is uh, two orders of magnitude larger and, and quite susceptible, as is uh, tuberculosis and as is uh, streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, I didn't uh, add coronaviruses to, to this figure, but the, uh, the coronaviruses that have had their rate constants measured come out around 0 0.003 something. So they're in the same range as tuberculosis and strep and influenza and measles, which is also not <clears throat> listed here, which means that it's uh, really quite manageable with UV. There, there are no SARS-CoV-2 rate constant measurements that I'm aware of yet, but the characteristics from one coronavirus to another in terms of their uh, structure, their uh, RNA would suggest that there probably won't be big differences between the ones that have been measured and uh, the real thing, which uh, we hope soon to have measurements for. So the measurement of this rate constant is a, a fairly difficult thing. So you'll find uh, in some cases, some widely varying measurements under different uh, circumstances. And sometimes the, they're hard to explain if there was enough information about exactly how the test was done. But we do have many, many measurements that we can use in uh, the design process. So now to the UV sources. Uh, we'll focus first here on, on uh, 254 nanometer, which is uh, the vast majority of systems that are, are being installed today. Uh, that is generated predominantly by low pressure mercury vapor lamps. They uh, produce a number of different spectral lines, but the strongest one is at 253.7 nanometers. It's the same technology as we find in fluorescent lamps uh, with a few significant uh, differences. Uh, the, the big difference is that in a fluorescent lamp, we have a glass tube that's coated with the phosphor. So the, uh, the 254 nanometer UV that's produced by the plasma in the lamp when we pass a current through the uh, uh, argon and uh, mercury in the lamp to produce a mercury plasma is absorbed on the, the uh, phosphor on the lamp tube and it re-radiates as visible light. So if we wanna make that a germicidal lamp, we simply have to provide a tube that's transparent uh, to the extent possible to 254 nanometer UV and that has no phosphor on it. Uh, 20 to 30% of the input power to um, a lamp system will typically come out as uh, germicidal radiation. So it's a, it's a pretty good conversion rate input to output. Uh, some of these lamps can last as much as uh, 9,000 hours, over that time they'll depreciate substantially by uh, at least 15 to 20%. And some, if they are, are driven at a, a high current, will depreciate faster and to a greater extent, but they'll have, uh, at least for a while, a higher output than uh, other lamps. You can see the spectrum of uh, a low pressure lamp on the right compared to the inactivation effectiveness curve. And that 254 line uh, is above 80%, close to 90%. So this is really a very good <clears throat> source. It's a technology that we've had around for a long time. I'll, I'll talk about other sources um, that may replace it, but currently this is the, uh, the main one. So uh, depreciation behavior of a mercury vapor lamp, this would be familiar to anyone who does much work with fluorescent lamps. Uh, there's also for hot cathode lamps, a, a short shortening of the life based on the switching rate because uh, every time the lamp starts, we tend to deposit material on the, the lamp tube that will uh, reduce the output and, and the uh, lamp itself is damaged over time. So the depreciation is important thing to know when doing a design calculation, how much uh, input lamp power do I need? 
The other thing that's really important is that, that particularly for um, lamps that use pure mercury, uh, there is something called a wind chill effect. So the, the plasma inside the lamp is affected by the temperature of the operating environment. And the, the, if the lamp surface becomes too cold or too warm, the output diminishes. So we'd like to operate lamps in an environment <clears throat> such that the surface temperature of the lamp is um, around uh, 40 degrees C. I think I may have done that uh, conversion wrong to, to Fahrenheit, but at any rate, 40 degrees C on the lamp surface. That's not the ambient temperature. It's the, the actual resulting surface temperature of the lamp based on the velocity and, and air temperature. And we see if we go uh, far in other directions, particularly on the cold side, we can lose a lot of output from these lamps. And that has to be accounted for in, in lamp selection. Uh, there are some lamps that are essentially fluorescent lamps, but not uh, pure mercury vapor uh, amalgam lamps. And one of the, the benefits of amalgam lamps is they tend to be uh, more stable across a range of temperatures than our pure mercury vapor lamps. But uh, they still have a wind chill effect and mercury vapor lamps are the, the most widely used. So this is a really important application factor because if you buy a lamp, you may see a rated output that is at room temperature with zero air velocity. And you may want to apply that lamp downstream of a cooling coil in an air handling unit where the, uh, the wind chill effect is going to reduce its capacity uh, quite substantially. Now, this is something we studied in a research project a few years ago at, uh, in, in my group. <clears throat> we put lamps in a little wind tunnel where we could control the temperature and the airspeed. And we used an infrared camera to experimentally determine the cold spot temperature on uh, the lamp tube surface. And we put a research grade radiometer underneath the lamp in a consistent location and measure the relative output under different operating conditions so that we could develop wind chill maps of lamps. You see on the left in this figure, a, a center of a tube a cold spot temperature measurement for a lamp in cross flow. So air is coming from uh, left to right there and on the leading edge of this cylinder in cross flow is where we expect to find the lowest temperature. The, the other figure shows the hot spot by the cathode on the lamp where uh, power is being put in. So we use that data to show how you could make maps that show the relative output. Here's a, a figure that shows uh, the relative performance, percent of maximum output for a particular lamp in, in cross flow as a function of air temperature and air velocity. And you can see that there are operating conditions uh, around where you might be in a, uh, an air handler application, say 15, 17, uh, C and, and maybe two, two and a half uh, meters per second, where we're at only uh, 50 to 60 percent of the output <clears throat> that the lab can produce under ideal conditions when it's uh, at, at more of a room temperature condition. So uh, something that always comes up in discussions of uh, UVGI, ultraviolet germicidal radiation, is the potential for germicidal lamps, the mercury lamps in particular, to produce ozone. Uh, the spectrum of a mercury vapor lamp includes a small amount of, of power output at 185 nanometers, and that is in the range that produces ozone. Uh, this figure illustrates how that is easily handled in lamp design. There's some uh, lamp materials like synthetic fused quartz that will transmit 90% of that 185 nanometer UV and they are going to produce ozone. But if we use a, a titanium doped fused quartz, which would be the red curve that's off to the, the right in this figure, you can see that its uh, transmittance at 185 nanometers is essentially zero. So uh, if you simply select the right lamp, which a manufacturer of uh, UVGI equipment should be providing with their equipment or which you can ask for from a manufacturer, there should be no problem. And in fact, in the United States, uh, 
UV and other devices that potentially produce ozone are being certified to the uh, UL 876 and 2998 standards. So there's a, now a test you can do <clears throat> that will demonstrate that the uh, ozone concentration resulting from operation of an air cleaner will be under 0 0.005 parts per million. And, and uh, if a manufacturer has certified to that standard, then that product is not presenting an ozone risk. So that's the, the current technology. We uh, are standardized on mercury vapor lamps, but uh, as in every other aspect of uh, lighting technology, we fully expect that LEDs eventually will displace the mercury vapor lamp because <clears throat> they have, when fully developed, uh, a lot of good characteristics. Long life, they can be configured very flexibly because they're small and can be uh, made into all sorts of shapes. Uh, the wavelengths can be tuned. We're no longer limited to the physical characteristics of uh, mercury plasmas. Uh, they can be dimmed. They can be cycled without having an adverse effect on the lamp. They behave better in the range of environmental conditions that uh, we see in places where we need to apply UVGI, and they don't contain any mercury. So, um, for all those reasons, we, we certainly expect that the technology will develop to the point where we will no longer use mercury vapor lamps. Some of the, the current barriers are uh, the low output of these devices, which is in the milliwatt range, uh, the cost and, and the durability, and uh, the lack of standards for <clears throat> dealing with them to uh, specify their performance in products. So this figure shows some available uh, UV LEDs, and you can see that we have uh, LEDs that produce wavelengths that, that go all the way from uh, around 250 nanometers, uh, so 265, which is right where we would like it to be in terms of uh, UVC germicidal uh, effectiveness, all the way up to 405, which is just across the line into the visible light spectrum. There, there have been some research uh, investigations that suggest that 405 can be germicidal. That's something that's still a, uh, <clears throat> a developing concept and technology. Uh, there's been a lot of work also on devices <clears throat> that are around 360, 370. You see that line there as well. That is in the UVA range, which has a much lower germicidal effectiveness, but uh, is not irritating to uh, skin and eyes, which is something we'll have to talk about with respect to 265. Um, what I haven't shown here is the far UV rate range uh, down there around 220. That's a completely different type of lamp. We, uh, we don't have U, uh, LEDs there yet. It's something called an eczema lamp that produces uh, a strong line around 222. <clears throat> so you can see on the uh, the uh, right the relative effectiveness of some of these different wavelengths. So one of the important benefits of LEDs when we uh, have a good opportunity to use them is that they behave much better under uh, different application conditions. And actually, if we take a an LED that performs well at uh, typical room conditions, which we need under some conditions, and we put it in an, uh, an environment that's colder, its uh, output can, can actually go up. So where a mercury vapor lamp tends to lose capacity <clears throat> in a colder environment, an LED is actually happier there. So there's a lot to look forward to with the development of that technology, but it's not uh, available in the, the power levels yet that we need for HVAC applications. It's being used for things like disinfecting stethoscopes and uh, other relatively smaller uh, applications. So now let's look at some of the application issues for uh, germicidal radiation, lamp output variation, and its effects that we've been talking about, humidity, safety, effect on materials, and a few words about uh, combining different types of air treatment. <clears throat> so the uh, Output of a typical lamp is measured after 100 hours of burn in at uh, conditions of sort of a normal room temperature and ambient 
error velocity, and that may not be representative. Depreciation reduces the output of a lamp. So when we're selecting a system, we want to base the uh, amount of lamp power that we specify on the worst case combinations of, of temperature and velocity, and also taking into account the uh, end of life depreciation of the lamp. <clears throat> Humidity um, really doesn't have uh, an effect on the output of lamps themselves. Uh, doesn't affect the heat transfer if we go from zero to 100% relative humidity. And uh, the optical characteristics of the air between zero and 100% relative humidity don't change enough that there is a significant difference in extinction and absorption of UV uh, along paths of the length that we would typically find in applications. So uh, from one side of a fairly large room to the other. On the other hand, there is an effect of humidity on the uh, rate constant of some microorganisms. Uh, it may be higher or lower uh, as the humidity changes from low to high. And that, that's something that uh, can be looked up in the literature on rate constants when you're doing an analysis for a design. Material compatibility is an important issue if you're doing retrofits. Um, 254 nanometer UVC will degrade a lot of materials that are found in HVAC systems. So if you're using a relatively high powered system to do air infection in an induct application, as we'll talk about here in a few minutes, you need to uh, pay some attention to the materials that are exposed to UV. So uh, some synthetic filter media that uh, may have organic content uh, can be degraded, uh, although other filter media uh, can be cleaned by UV. Uh, gasketing materials, insulation on wiring, and, and plastic pipe. So uh, these things need to be uh, either substituted for or shielded from UV in, in application, or you may have a, a problem over time. Um, so as you see there, uh, the rule of thumb is shield uh, organic components that are within four to five feet or about one and a half meters of, of germicidal lamps. Uh, ASHRAE did an extensive study on this that's documented in uh, the report for Research Project 1509. ASHRAE members can download that report from the, uh, the ASHRAE website. Uh, this is something that I describe in a fair amount of detail in the, the three-hour uh, ASHRAE Learning Institute course that I occasionally do, and that's scheduled for June 11th in case anyone is interested in that. You can uh, look that up in, at the ASHRAE website and register for it if you're, you're interested in more detail on some of these things. I mentioned safety before. Uh, both UVB and UVC cause uh, skin and eye irritation. UVB is a component of sunlight that reaches the ground and it has some ability to penetrate the skin surface. And uh, so it's uh, really quite dangerous if you're overexposed to it because not only can it cause superficial burns, it also uh, can be carcinogenic. But the, the radiation that we're using in a, a germicidal application with mercury vapor lamps uh, only affects uh, the, the very surface layer of the skin. And while it can cause a burn uh, and it can cause eye irritation, it's not considered to be carcinogenic. Uh, nevertheless, we, we don't want to overexpose. We can, uh, can get UVB and UVC exposure from leakage out of uh, uh, illumination lamps. So if you have uh, fluorescent lamps that have been in place for a long time, the phosphor can come off of the tube particularly at the ends, and you may get leaking. Uh, upper room systems that we'll discuss later are actually used in occupied spaces, and if they're not properly installed, they may result in some exposure to occupants as well. Uh, NIOSH in the, the US, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health has established uh, recommended exposure limits for 253.7 nanometer UVC. Uh, I've uh, shown some examples of, of those limits here. So for, for one minute exposure, the most you can be exposed to is 100 microwatts per centimeter squared. That is a level that you might find in, uh, in some systems that are used inside of air handling units or ducts uh, at 
eight hours, the safe exposure is 0.2 microwatts per centimeter squared, which is quite low. And that becomes a safety criterion for systems that are used in occupied spaces where there might be some accidental exposure by reflection of uh, occupants in the space. We'll, we'll talk more about that when we look at that particular application. So to protect uh, people from the effects of uh, exposure to UVC, which are unpleasant, it's, it's like a sunburn um, and the eye irritation, photokeratitis feels like having sand in your eyes and it lasts about 48 hours after you've been exposed, but we, we don't want that to happen. Uh, we can put safeties in, in systems so that uh, the maintenance worker who's not properly clothed with protective equipment or someone who just accidentally opens a, a door uh, will not be exposed because the, the lamps will be switched off. Uh, training of maintenance staff is important as well, and maintenance of, of equipment so that it's functioning properly is also important. So those are some of the main issues of, of Another point I'd like to make here before we move on to the, the different equipment types is that uh, we don't need to rely on any one of these three technologies that we've discussed to do all of our uh, microbial control in, in air on surfaces. Uh, UVGI has some good characteristics and we can get to a certain point with it. Filters also uh, are uh, effective at moving particles, but if we want to do all of the part the particle removal with filters, that can be expensive. And likewise, lots of ventilation to achieve low levels of airborne concentration can be expensive. But find that if you look at the uh, synergistic effects of all three of these, to have some UVGI to a pretty good level of uh, inactivation, 80, 90 percent, and filters that are removing. 60, 70, 80 percent of particulate matter in the range we're concerned about, and a reasonable amount of ventilation, at least meeting minimum standards, that that, that can be a very effective combination that uh, will handle both smaller microorganisms that are difficult to filter and larger microorganisms that may be difficult to inactivate but are easy to remove because of their size. So now on to the, uh, the various system types. Uh, there are room decontamination systems. Um, many of them are portable as shown in the, the figure on the right. These have come to be called uh, UV robots because the, uh, the more recent of these are motorized like a, a robot vacuum cleaner and can move around a space. So this is used in an unoccupied space because we don't want to expose uh, anyone to a large dose of 254 nanometer UVC, they can be controlled by remote controls, as you see there in the, the bottom figure. And uh, they sit there for a while and will in, inactivate uh, microorganisms on surfaces. So these are used a lot in healthcare applications where we're concerned about HAIs uh, and other pathogens that may be in uh, rooms where uh, infected patients are or where medical procedures may be performed. And this has been shown to be effective on some of the, uh, the most important uh, HAI pathogens like uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus and, and uh, Clostridium difficile. Uh, this can also be done with fixed lamps, and uh, that's actually a fairly common application too. So instead of a portable unit, you could have a specific room you wanted to clean, and you could install a surface cleaning system uh, on the, the ceiling of that room. Self-contained devices uh, also exist. Here's an example of one that is placed over the, the head of a bed and it would have an air intake on the, the bottom and inside of the, the white box you see there on the wall uh, would be a, a chamber where air would be irradiated and then it is reintroduced into the room. So this works like any other portable air cleaner. They can be designed to have high single pass inactivation, but like any air cleaner, one of the critical parameters is how much air they move and uh, whether we get the, uh, an appropriate number of air changes for the space in which it's being used. You notice in this particular one, it's placed over the head of a patient's bed. This could perhaps be an infection isolation room to try to capture respiratory aerosol. Uh, 
one of the first, maybe the first application of uh, UVGI was the upper room system. So in, in upper room systems, fixtures are placed uh, either on the ceiling or on walls above the height of the occupied zones. It's important to have a high enough ceiling to do this so you can create a disinfection zone that uh, is not going to result in exposure to occupants. So the, the fixture that you see there has standard germicidal lamps in it, but because it's installed in this case in a relatively low ceilinged room, it has a lot of uh, plates on it to ensure that the, the light coming out of it is focused mainly uh, into a horizontal plane with minimal leakage. Uh, lamps as rated, the typical uh, lamp rating at room temperature and, and low air velocity gives you a good idea of how these are going to perform. There are other fixtures that can be used in higher ceiling applications where you don't need all of those louvers and they are, are more efficient because uh, they don't take out nearly as much of the, the UV power that's generated by the lamps as these ones that uh, have to be uh, provided with these uh, vanes to, to focus the beam. So upper room systems uh, have been used since uh, early in the, the 20th century and they are used extensively in healthcare applications. The uh, Centers for Disease Control uh, in, in the US, as you saw earlier, approved use of UBGI in the 1990s and it's still in their updated tuberculosis control guidelines that were published in, in 2005. And in 2009, uh, NIOSH published a, a document on design of upper room systems for tuberculosis control uh, applications, which can be downloaded from their website. And it's, it's a very uh, good uh, guide in terms of explaining how that technology works and, and providing guidelines on how to apply it. Uh, here you see someone in a in a, a, a patient room and there's one uh, germicidal fixture on the wall. You can see that from the, the little bit of visible light reflecting off the ceiling that this one is, is not uh, like the other one we saw. The lamp is really uh, open and they're using the high ceiling in this case uh, to distribute the, the radiation uh, without having to put something in front of the lamps to prevent exposure of that patient. Uh, in duct systems are uh, another commonly used application. So we put lamps in moving air streams, either actually in an air distribution supply or return duct, or uh, more commonly in an air handling unit. We, we call all of that uh, in duct generically. Uh, the reasons for putting <clears throat> the, the lamps in the air handling unit instead of in a duct, if, if that can be done, are first of all, that we often have higher velocities in ducts than we have in air handling units. So that affects the potential exposure time. And also uh, there's microbial growth on the surfaces of wetted cooling coils <clears throat> that can be controlled by UV. So if, if we put an air disinfection system in an air handling unit, it can help uh, not only disinfect the air, but it can keep the, uh, the cooling coil surfaces free of biofouling and perhaps also protect uh, filters. The sizing of these systems uh, really is very dependent on the uh, geometry in which they're installed. How much uh, line of sight do I have and how fast is the air moving? Here's an example of a, uh, a commercial induct system. This is a few years old. Uh, the, the installations are actually easier than you see here. The, you see that the manufacturer has provided a, uh, a channel uh, frame that has lamps attached to it and those would connect to the, the ballast and it's placed um, a short distance off of the downstream side of the cooling coil here so that it throws uh, light onto the, the coil surface to disinfect it and also can dose the air as it moves through. Uh, the, the more recent technologies for installing these uh, in some cases actually use magnets so you don't have to drill any holes in the air handling unit to do a retrofit to install a, a set of lamps that have been sized and, and uh, fabricated by the manufacturer. So hook up the power uh, and uh, it's ready to go. 
Uh, this can also be done on filter banks that have a, a fouling problem. So here's a, a photo of UV installed to uh, irradiate filter surfaces to keep them clean. Uh, this uh, coiled and uh, condensate pan treatment is something that uh, the General Services Administration, the agency of the US government that manages a lot of its facilities, it has put into its standards. P100 is the mechanical system standard. And, and for its highest level of IAQ performance, it uh, requires putting in UV to irradiate cooling coils and pans. It doesn't require <clears throat> um, air disinfection at this point. Uh, the amount of, of UV that's necessary to disinfect uh, a coil or a filter surface is very small compared to a uh, air disinfection system because you have an infinite amount of time to irradiate it. So uh, different criteria have been applied. You measure the amount of UV that comes through the coil as one design parameter, or uh, you can measure the uh, irradiance on the, the face of the coil. Typically 200 microwatts per square centimeter is around uh, where these systems are designed, but some use more and some say that less, even as little as 50 microwatts per square centimeter is uh, effective. So those are the main technology op options. So let's briefly look at effectiveness. I mentioned earlier the 1937 installations in schools that was written up in a publication in 1942 by Wells, Wells and Wilder from the Harvard School of Public Health. This was an upper room application and they were tracking uh, various infections in classrooms, both controls and classrooms that had upper room fixtures in them. And in particular, particular they looked at uh, measles outbreaks. So here's a picture from that paper that shows in the center over the, the students, a germicidal uh, upper room fixture. You don't see them like that anymore, but uh, that was what they were using. And on the right, you see two uh, plots that show over a period of time the number of uh, new infections of measles in irradiated classrooms at the, at the top, which was never more than uh, 5% per, per week. And the uh, infections in unirradiated control classrooms, which were uh, over 20% during the same period of time. So there was a very significant reduction in the incidence of infections during that particular epidemic. And this was done in, in several schools over a period of years. Uh, there was also uh, a paper published in uh, The Lancet several years ago about a double blind study that was done in two office buildings where UV was installed in air handling units. Um, and it was operated on and off in a double blind manner. So neither the occupants of the building nor the researchers knew when the UV was on or off. And they did some measurements in the building of uh, microbial levels in the air and on surfaces. And they also surveyed the occupants for sick building syndrome symptoms. And uh, the findings for that were uh, significant. 99% uh, reduction of microbial endotoxin concentrations on surfaces in the air handling units, no adverse effects reported, and a statistically significant reduction of symptoms. So this is a study that had a lot of influence on uh, uh, making us confident that these applications were actually beneficial, even in a general indoor air quality sense, not just for purposes like mitigating a pandemic, which is our concern today. Uh, the, the systems for cleaning surfaces have been studied extensively. You find a lot of articles about that in journals like the American Journal of Infection Control and uh, I'll just say that there have been many studies that show that, uh, first of all, uh, healthcare associated uh, pathogens are uh, treated effectively by UV, and that in many cases, these studies have shown that uh, UV has been more effective than conventional surface cleaning, although that should be done too. Uh, but as an adjunct to conventional cleaning techniques, it's been very effective. Now, here's a the results of a study where a number of um, uh, different pathogens were measured. And these were rooms that were cleaned for turnover. 
And uh, you see uh, before manual cleaning and after manual cleaning, there isn't much change. In some cases, there's no change in the number of rooms that were found to have uh, these pathogens in them. But over on the right-hand side, we have the results for uh, UV disinfection after manual cleaning. And what we see there are very significant reductions in the number of contaminated rooms. So in the one case uh, where we went from 21 to 17 with manual cleaning, we now are, are down to two out of 61 after UV. So as I say, there's a, a large uh, number of studies that uh, show effectiveness. Here's uh, another one on clinical trials that uh, showed 10 to 30% reduction in infections uh, when UV was used to disinfect rooms. For coil treatment systems, uh, this is another thing that we did some research uh, on. I actually worked uh, on a project that ASHRAE partially funded in collaboration with Chandra Shakar from um, uh, National University of, of Singapore. And uh, here are some of the results from uh, an air handling unit in a building there. Uh, you can see in the upper left that uh, from before UV, the red data, to after UV, the blue data, there was a significant reduction in the uh, pressure drop across the coil that was, was something like 15%. Uh, the heat transfer coefficient was found to increase, and that resulted uh, not only in a lower uh, airside pressure drop and less fan power use, but also in less chilled water flow rate through the coil that reduced by a certain amount. And you know, we did simulation that, that showed uh, effects on fan energy, pump energy, and even to a, a small extent, chiller energy. And that's a paper in building environment that you can read if you're interested. So briefly about the economics, uh, in, in US dollar terms, we're talking about um, something that should be less than $10 a square foot. I, I did this um, for upper room, I did this estimate a few years ago and came up with a, a first cost installed for a system of about two and a half dollars per square foot. I, I think you might uh, double that today, um, but still should be under uh, $10 a square foot based on what I found from contacting manufacturers recently. And the operating cost is pretty modest as well. So uh, 13 cents per square foot per year for a continuous operation at a typical average electricity cost. That compares to about $2 a square foot per year for energy cost for a typical building. So it's a it's an increase, but not a, a huge one. Um, these are the relatively expensive and expensive to operate systems, but they have very high effectiveness. An upper room system could have the uh, effect of as much as uh, 10 to, to 100 air changes of ventilation as shown in some of the studies that have been done. For induct systems, if we look at how much lamp power is required for those systems and um, the cost of, of lamps and the amount of air that's being distributed and the typical amount of air that it takes to condition a building with something like a variable air volume system, um, with all of those assumptions, I estimated a, a first cost of about 10 cents per square foot for a, a typical all air system. And that's a, again, a very uh, back of envelope kind of estimate, but less than a dollar per square foot. So that's quite a bit less expensive than upper room. And the operating uh, costs are likewise much smaller, the energy use. But the difference between uh, upper room and induct is that while I might be able to get the equivalent of 50 air changes with the upper room system, I'm limited for uh, an air handler installation to whatever the air changes are that that system produces in, in supply air. So there's a, uh, a good cost benefit to the uh, induct system, but uh, in some sense, the upper room may be more effective for things like infection control in crowded spaces. So now for uh, a little performance analysis here, and this is uh, just an example of, of how induct systems work to illustrate some of the, uh, the application issues. So we did a, a study uh, a while ago, one of my graduate students and I, uh, looking at uh, a system 
installed in a typical office building and we, we modeled the energy use of the system with uh, eQuest, a, a freely available piece of whole building modeling software. And we modeled the uh, IAQ control with uh, custom MATLAB code and, and did an economic analysis as well as a performance analysis, so first cost, labor and equipment, and uh, energy cost, uh, comparing filters and induct uh, UBGI. So the, the building was, was placed in, uh, in New York City for the, the climate impact, and uh, we assumed that we had a VAV system that was conditioning interior spaces. So it was always in cooling mode. That was a kind of a simplifying assumption just to assume that it was running in cooling mode all year. Because in many parts of the world, it actually would run in cooling mode all year. Uh, we used typical for the time assumptions about filtration. So we assumed that there was a, a MERV-6 pre-filter, which is what ASHRAE standard 62.1 would have required. And all of the other operating parameters you see there are, are pretty typical of these types of systems. So we're circulating air through some occupied spaces, which were not modeled in much detail. And the air um, in the base case goes through our, our pre-filter MERV-6. And we looked at uh, three different options. One is that we have UVGI upstream of the cooling coil where the environment tends to be a little warmer, downstream of the cooling coil where it's colder. And we also looked at a filter that had the same uh, impact on a uh, test particle size as the UV for uh, a microorganism that we assumed to be the uh, threat that we were controlling. So again, those three system options here, um, base HVAC with downstream UV, base HVAC with upstream UV and base HVAC with a, a MERV-12 filter added. The reason we did MERV-12 was that that was closest to giving us the same uh, additional removal of, uh, of uh, uh, pathogenic particles as we were getting from our UV design. So this figure shows the uh, some of the design aspects of the UV system. Uh, we assumed 85% single pass inactivation and we used Staph aureus uh, just for convenience. And you can see its K value there, 0 0.0035. Uh, incidentally, that's about the same as a coronavirus. And we assumed that that was writing on one micrometer particles. We didn't do a, uh, a distribution of particle sizes. And, and if we look at the uh, efficiency of removal of those particles by MERV 6, 12, and 13 filters. It's 15, 82, and 90% for a typical filter. So that's why we chose the, the MERV 12. It was, uh, was about at the same level as our, our system. And we used a, a typical lamp that would go into to this type of system, one that had been modeled in our study. I showed you the pictures earlier of our lamp tests. This was a lamp that we had studied. And, and so the, the box on this figure at the right is, is superimposed on that lamp's characteristics, and it shows the operating ranges. If we go upstream of the coil, we have a range of conditions that goes from uh, pretty cold to pretty warm. Uh, while if we're downstream and in cooling mode all the time, we have a much more restricted range of temperature and it stays in the cold region. You can see also the velocity range over the course of the year for this VAV system. So when we looked at all of the possible combinations from a year of simulation for uh, temperature and air velocity, it turned out that we had different selection points for the lamp. So uh, upstream of the coil, we had that condition at about 10 degrees C and one and a half meters per second. And you can see there that the effectiveness of the lamp is at uh, close to 35% of what it would be under the optimal condition. For the supply air condition, uh, it was higher air velocity at the same temperature. And there the uh, output was only uh, about 27, 28%. So it takes more power from the lamps in the downstream configuration because of that to produce the, uh, the same output as the lamps upstream. 
And also because the selection criterion is at a higher velocity, that's going to reduce the exposure time at the design condition for the downstream installation. So this shows the results of, of that in terms of the dose. We wound up to get the same uh, impact needing 364 watts of uh, input power upstream of the coil and 718 downstream because of the combination of exposure time and lamp output. So we included uh, initial costs uh, for installation and uh, relamping costs and energy cost in our economic analysis and sizing affected all of those things. So I won't go through all the details here because of time, but we used the typical values we got from manufacturers for UV equipment and values from the literature for uh, the pressure drop through MERV-12 filters. That's a number that could be quite different depending on the style of filter you use, but we used a fairly conservative one in terms of the, uh, the pressure drop, uh, 250 pascals uh, additional pressure drop compared to the MERV-6 filter. And we uh, did a, a life cycle cost analysis on that. We also did a health benefit estimate using the wells riley equation. So as I mentioned before in a couple of places, you can uh, take any air cleaner and uh, convert its performance level into an equivalent ventilation rate. The wells riley equation relates the uh, amount of infectious material being produced by infected individuals and the, uh, the time of exposure of susceptible individuals and the ventilation rate to determine a probability of infection. So, what we were doing was looking at the relative risk of infection under uh, a base case and using UVGI. I won't go through the details of this. Those are in the, the paper we published. And so we, we had a base absentee rate uh, that we used. And by calculating relative risk of infection and assuming that infected people would stay home from work and knowing what an average person would make in an office building, we could calculate the value of the uh, reduced infection risk that was produced by having UV in the system or, or the filter for that matter. So here are the energy results. And what we found was that there were fairly significant differences in energy use between these three cases and that the, the filters uh, required the, the highest energy use and cost and UV upstream of the cooling coil resulted in the, the lowest energy cost. Now, I should say that uh, coil disinfection generally works better downstream. So that's why many systems are installed there, even though it's true that the, uh, the sizing would probably be more favorable upstream. If you go to the bottom, you see the, uh, the cost per square meter or per square foot in US dollars. And, and for both of the UV installations, they're pretty small. For the, the filter, uh, fairly significant. And in life cycle cost terms, we uh, get the same thing. Now, without the uh, air quality benefit, we have modest costs for UV and, and fairly significant costs for filters. If we do include the effect of the UV on uh, predicted effect on, on sick leave, what we find is that the, the risk of infection predicted by the Wells-Riley model uh, was reduced by about 50%. So we could reduce our anticipated sick leave cost by that amount. And so that produced a, a very large benefit. This is always what happens when we calculate the benefits of air quality interventions. The, uh, the benefit uh, in terms of health was um, uh, $700 or more per person or uh, $40 per, per square meter, so quite large. Remember, we're talking about, in terms of uh, annualized costs, less than a dollar per square meter for uh, the UVGI. So that's a pretty good uh, cost benefit. So that's one example of, of uh, how this technology works. We've published a whole report on the coil disinfection systems, and the economics there can be quite good too, especially when you take into account uh, reduced uh, typical chemical and power washing type of maintenance. 
So to, to conclude here, um, this is not a new technology. It's very well understood. It's been around for a long time. There are a lot of different ways to apply it in, uh, in buildings to uh, make uh, HVAC systems better in terms of controlling microorganisms and also to control uh, microbial contamination on surfaces. Uh, the best applications are going to be in those where we can actually calculate the value. Um, but even if we don't have a good way of calculating the air quality benefit, uh, we still know that, that these systems are uh, doing good things when we put them into buildings. And, and finally, that there are a lot of technological developments coming that may broaden our uh, available options and make the systems even more effective and, and more cost effective. So if you want to do more reading on this, there are a lot of ASHRAE sources for it. Uh, UV is mentioned in the position document on infectious aerosols that was just published uh, in um, April. And there are two chapters in the ASHRAE handbook, one in systems and equipment and one in applications that discuss the technology. There's a good ASHRAE journal article that was published in 2008 that uh, summarizes best practices concisely. Uh, a whole book on UV by uh, Kowalski, who was a student of mine. It's a, a Springer monograph that, that covers the technology very comprehensively. It's a 400 page book. Uh, and you can download the NIOSH guidelines for upper room uh, TB uh, control systems from the, the URL though. So, uh, and there's much more, but these are some good places to start if you're interested in technology. And so with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention and um, I'll take questions if we have time for those. Thank you, William, sir, for the very interesting and very good uh, presentation on uh, UVGI air and surface dis disinfection. We are near, uh, we are approximately near to end this webinar. Before the ending of this webinar, we will uh, take us five to ten minutes on question and answers. So I am seeing lo uh, lots of questions in my question panel. So first question for you, sir, is: Is it possible to increase power of UVC lamp by using any re reflection surface? Um, yes, we didn't talk about that, but um, if, if you have a non-reflective enclosure, then all you will get is the direct output of the lamp. But if you put it in a uh, reflective environment, you will generate a, a much uh, higher fluence field and a more uniform one. You know, fortunately, the, the reflectivity of, uh, of sheet metal for induct applications is, is pretty good. So uh, you should take advantage of that. Um, reflectors are used to focus the output of lamps on coils when you have a purely coil treatment system. But uh, that's important. And, and, and because of the reflectivity being important, it makes uh, design calculations for air handler applications kind of complicated. But there is software that manufacturers use that will take into account the uh, reflectivity of the enclosure and the geometric factors. And uh, that, that ensures that you get a, uh, a reasonable design. Okay. Thank you, sir. For, uh, the next question is, how do we deal with the ozone generation which happens in the UVC bandwidth? All right, so uh, you'll recall I actually uh, showed uh, a slide on that, that uh, two slides. One that showed that a, a mercury vapor lamp produces some 185 nanometer UV, which causes ozone. Uh, as that slide showed, if your tube is made out of uh, quartz doped with titanium, it has zero transmittance at 185 nanometers. So that's how you control ozone, by using a lamp that has the proper tube material. If you have synthetic quartz, it transmits over 80% uh, of the 185 and you're going to have an ozone problem. So it's, it's critically important to ensure that you're getting lamps that have tubes that will not transmit the 185. Now the other way you can control ozone is when we move to, uh, to LEDs, if you get an LED that produces just 265 nanometer UVC and produces nothing in the range that produces ozone, that's not going to be a problem either. So this, this always comes up and it can be a problem, but the only way it can be a problem is that if you select the wrong equipment. Okay, 
so next question is will the hot surface temperature of the lamp add additional heat to the air stream will this need to be considered during system design or energy modeling if yes generally what would be the temperature increase to the air stream before and after uh I, i've forgotten what the the actual number is for a typical installation but it's extremely small i mean we're, we're talking about for a fairly high powered induct system um maybe a tenth of a degree centigrade maybe less than that it's it's pretty much negligible as is the pressure drop that's caused by putting some lamps in the airstream so it's, it's not even enough to affect your your load and energy calculations uh, before they pass the decimal point. Okay, uh, the next question is, how can we validate performance of UV lamp in real time situations? Uh, well, you, you can validate that uh, your system is producing the output that it was designed to do. So you do a design calculation to achieve a, a certain output and you can take a, a high quality radiometer and uh, measure that you're getting the uh, irradiance that you should have at a certain point if you put it in an induct system or if you're uh, looking at the the disinfection zone in an upper room system and and uh, measurement of radiation is also important with an upper room system because you want to make sure you're not leaking more than that 0.2 microwatts per square centimeter into the occupied zone so it's important when you install those systems to go around and and take measurements in different places there have been cases where it's been installed in healthcare facilities where there are a lot of monitors and there are monitors all over the place these days and uh, those screens can reflect uv and there have been cases where uh, the orientation of the screens was such that they were creating a hot spot but so that measurement uh, certainly one could take a challenge microorganism and do tests that would require uh, sampling and, and culturing of, uh, of either viruses or, or bacteria, but that's not often done. I think you, you would generally rely on the, uh, the design calculation, then show that your, your system is producing the intended output. Okay, now the last question is, what is the estimated fluence necessary to irradiate an air stream? It was mentioned 50 to 200 micron watt per centimeter square for surface jet coil and filters. Uh, but is there a rule of thumb based on CFM for air st uh, stream disinfection? The, actually, the uh, uh, the amount that you would need would uh, go back to the the design equation that I showed at the uh, the beginning of the the talk. Right, we have this exponential disinfection equation, and uh, you know what your um, a velocity is through your air handling unit and you know the rate constant of the microorganism that you want to treat um, so you can calculate the exposure time and for the desired level of inactivation you can then calculate what the average uh, fluence has to be and uh, in in a lot of systems that turns out to be in an air handling unit uh, on the order of, of uh, several hundred to several thousand microwatts per square centimeter. So a lot more uh, lamp power than is required for coil uh, disinfection, but not an unreasonable amount that doesn't have a big effect on either the uh, energy consumption of the system or on the temperature of the supplier. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, due to the lack of time, we will not answer the rest of the questions. I request everyone the questions which are not answered by us uh, you can write uh, your question at our email id sj.chp at gmail.com we will ans answer this question on later on stage so yeah thank you uh, now i thank you all, all your uh, uh, for uh, participation today i am uh, very thankful to the, my Ashre Chandigarh team. I thank you, Ashre Falcom Chapter team, who uh, who help us to promote this webinar. I also uh, thank you, Youth at Ashre, for supporting uh, supporting us for this uh, prestigious uh, webinar. So I again thank you all, all for your uh, participation. We are so grateful.
for your support without you uh, this would not be possible keep participating and learning with ashray chandigarh chapter uh, our next webinar is on uh, 23rd may 2020 uh, at 6 pm the topic of the next webinar is two stage indirect or direct evaporative cooling system the speaker for this webinar will be professor dr As asam e khalid he is a ashray dl so uh, recording of this uh, today webinar will be uploaded at uh, uploaded on our youtube channel uh, digital channel ashray chandigarh please subscribe uh, our ashray digital channel for more videos and for latest, uh, latest updates from the ashray these are the our upcoming webinars which will have, which are scheduled by ashray chandigarh so the our next webinar is on 23rd May. Then next we have uh, 26th May, 30 May, 6th June, and 20 June. At the end, I thank you again, all of you, for the participation. Stay safe and stay connected with us. Thank you.